So, as she said, I'm Joe Vandermeer. I'm going to talk about hearing loss. Uh, to understand how you have hearing loss, you've got to understand how your hearing works. So I'm going to spend a little time talking about how sound comes to us and how it's turned into meaning. Uh, and then I'll talk about how it's broken, and then I'll talk about how we can fix it. Uh, the ear is, is built in three parts. There's the external ear. Uh, oops, pardon me. I'm going to try and point on this. Can anybody see that the little red dot? Can you? Yep. Okay. So the external ear here uh, is the part you can see, obviously. Sound waves come to us as uh, air molecules moving back and forth, just like a wave in the lake is water molecules moving back and forth. Uh, the speakers are making these vibrations and they're coming to your ears. The outer part of your ear kind of cups and directs the sound down into the ear canal. This is the part you're not ever supposed to put Q-tips. Uh, the sound gets concentrated down at the, at the bottom end of that tunnel called the eardrum. Okay, now the eardrum is a very thin, very small little piece of tissue. It looks kind of like wax paper. Uh, as the air molecules hit it, it moves that eardrum back and forth. Okay? Now in the middle ear, the, you have a series of ear bones. They're, it's called the acicular chain. Uh, it functions kind of like a pump handle, like a lever. Okay? So it increases the power of the movement of the eardrum down to the third of those three ear bones. Okay? And that functions kind of like a plunger. That plunger then pushes in and out, uh, and it creates a fluid wave. So the, the conductive portion of hearing is turning sound waves into fluid waves. Okay? It's a mechanical change that has to happen. Now, fluid waves aren't how we understand sound either, so that's the purview of the inner ear. Okay? Now, the inner ear has two parts. There's the balance part, the part that gives you vertigo if you're unlucky. And then there's the uh, cochlea, which is the part that turns sound waves, uh, I'm sorry, fluid waves into electrical signals. Okay, so I'm going to focus in on that cochlea because that's where a lot of our problem is. But this is fluid waves to electricity. And electricity is how your brain sends signals around in, in the neurons in your brain, and that's how it turns it into meaning. Okay? Now, if you look at the cochlea closer and you kind of cut a portion of it away, you can see that it's, a, it's like a conch shell. It's got a little tunnel, and it makes about two and a half turns as it goes around to the top of the conch shell. It has a single tunnel, but it's divided into three different canals, all right, three different little tunnels that are full of fluid. And that plunger pushes in and out of this one. And you can also see in the middle of this conch shell, there is a nerve coming in. And this is the nerve that goes up to your brain. Uh, and each of, the, each of these nerve fibers goes, and goes to a little switch right here uh, called a hair cell. Okay, So I'm going to focus in on that part that looks kind of like the center of a peace sign. Okay, so here's the first of those three tunnels where the plunger goes, and here's the middle tunnel. Now, we, we call everything in Latin because that's how we are. Uh, it's called the scala tympani and the scala media. And as that fluid wave comes down, I'm going to see if I don't get some feedback here. As that fluid wave comes down, this membrane moves up and down. Okay, it's called the basilar membrane. And as that moves up and down, these little rows of what are called hair cells push up against this membrane. Okay? Now, that becomes really important because the nerves, sorry, the nerves come in from the center here and are attached to those hair cells. All right? And that's the switch. It's just like a light switch. Right? You go over to the wall and you flick a light switch, uh, and the electrical signal goes up to the lights. Okay? Now, I'm going to focus even more on these hair cells. I, I don't mean to belabor the point, but this is pretty important. This is what a hair cell looks like. Now, this is about a million times as big as it actually is, but this is what it looks like. And it's got these little hairs out the top, okay? And when you push those hair in one direction, that creates an electrical charge in the cell, and it goes out to the nerve, and that's how signals go up to the brain, okay? I'm focusing on this because I want you to remember this, this part of the ear, because this is the part that's usually broken, okay? So if you put that all together, You've got sound waves that come in, and they beat on the eardrum. And then the eardrum moves that lever, that ear bone chain, and it pushes that plunger to generate that fluid wave that goes down the cochlea. Okay? Now, as those hair cells trip the triggers and the switches flick, the electrical signal goes up the nerve up to the brain. Okay? Now, 
I'm not going to talk about the processing portion of it because it's very, very complicated and we really don't understand it that well. Uh, but the most important thing is that that is not usually the part that's broken. So let's talk about how it is broken. Okay. If you look at somebody, this is actually an animal, but if you look at an animal who has normal hair cells, you'll see these rows and the white looking things are the hair cells. And if they undergo some damage to the cochlea, it starts to look like there aren't any hair cells left or there are very few left. Okay. So you know what hair loss looks like. Okay. Hair loss is influ influenced by a lot of things. So age is one of them. Genetics is another one of them. And the same is true for hair cell loss. Okay. So if you look at a, a cadaver, this is actually a human, but if you look at a cadaver of a, a person who doesn't have hearing loss and you compare that to a person who does have hearing loss, the part where those hair cells are is obviously much different. Okay. So I'm going to talk about the couple of different things that influence those, or at least the majority of people. Presbycusis just means you can't hear as well because you're getting old. Right? The Presbyterian church is, is uh, governed by the elders in the church, and that's what it means. Presby is old and cusis is hearing. Again, we we got to call everything in something Latin, otherwise we wouldn't have jobs, I guess. Uh, so if you look at people 65 to 75 years old, about a quarter to a third of them have some form of hearing loss. Okay, and actually, this just came out. This is a study that a friend of mine from Hopkins did. 63% of people older than 70 years old have mild to moderate hearing loss or worse. So almost two thirds of people uh, over the age of 70 have hearing loss. The treatment uh, is almost invariably hearing aids. Uh, hearing aids are used in about 40% of uh, patients with moderate hearing loss, but only about 3% of patients who have just mild hearing loss. Now, I'm going to give you a, an example of how mild hearing loss can affect people. There was a study of, of school kids, and the sensitivity for the testing you get at the pediatrician to screen, do you have hearing loss, it's not that accurate. It's pretty good if you're deaf or not but it's not great for do you have a small amount of hearing loss. And if you look at kids who have a small amount of hearing loss, about 37% of them fail a grade. If you look at kids who don't have hair, uh, hearing loss, and this is mild hearing loss, 2% of them fail a grade. So mild hearing loss is a significant problem, although especially stubborn people don't like to admit it is. Uh, but hearing aids are a very effective treatment for it. If it gets to the point where hearing aids <coughs> don't work, uh, cochlear implantation is also an option. I'm going to talk about both of those in a bit. Okay. What else can do it? Well, wind can blow over trees. Okay. Wind is just air molecules moving back and forth. And if loud, loud sounds come and hit your ear, you can get hair cell damage in the same way. So this is, uh, this is actually an animal again, but who has not experienced any loud sounds. And then this is after exposing them to really loud sounds. And it shows the amount of damage that can be incurred by a loud sound. Okay. There are two kinds of uh, noise-induced hearing loss. There's what we call temporary <coughs> threshold shifts. Okay. A temporary threshold shift is what happens to high school students when they go to rock concerts. Right? They come home and they can't hear and their ears are ringing, but in a couple of days it gets better. Now, permanent threshold shifts are what happens to the guys that have been playing the rock concerts, like Pete Townsend of The Who is now actually a poster child for a hearing aid company. They have such long-term damage that now they can't hear very well at all. Okay. So permanent threshold shifts occur after repeated and uh, ex uh, extended duration of noise exposure. Okay. The bad news is there are 10 million people in the country who are at risk for this because they work in an environment that's louder than 85 decibels. This is the threshold at which anything over 85 decibels can cause hearing loss. Now, 85 decibels is a bit louder than it is in here. This is maybe 60 decibels, but I'm going to get into that in a minute. The other thing that's alarming about this is that uh, people who work, this was actually a study of men because it's an older study, but uh, people who work in a quiet environment but shoot guns recreationally on the weekend are at the same risk for someone who's been working in a, a, a factory that has 89 decibels for 20 years. It's just to tell you that the louder a sound is, the more damaging it can be, and it can cause significant damage over a short period of time. The good news is 
Once you stop listening to loud sounds, it can't cause any more problems. The hearing loss that you've lost, the noise exposure you've had in the past can't make it worse. We can't get it back, but the things in my house that cause hearing loss are things like snow blowers and lawn mowers and weed whackers and chainsaws and skill saws and all these things. All of these things should be used with at least earplugs, if not earphones, to protect your ears because at uh, prolonged exposure to these will cause you to have hearing loss. The other good news is that initially when you lose some hearing, you lose quite a bit of hearing, but as you get less and less hearing, you tend to lose less. You don't have as much to lose, so you don't lose it as quickly. So I'm going to talk again about this decibel scale. So zero decibels is, uh, I, somebody told me this once, the sound of a mosquito flying 10 feet away. It's, it's quiet. I mean, it's basically no sound. Now, it doesn't actually mean zero sound. The, how, we, how we calculate decibels is a pretty complicated math formula but 20 decibels would be whispering. 60 decibels is, a, is about uh, a, an office where people are working. If I have a little decibel meter that on my phone, and it, it's a, it'd be about 40 decibels if I would stop talking, and it's, a, it's probably a little louder than that as I'm talking. Now, a factory or a heavy truck a couple feet away is about 90 decibels, okay? Now, the loudest sound in human history, at least that we know of, is a, the explosion of a volcano in 1876. Uh, it was in Indonesia, it was called Krakatoa. And there's a guy who wrote a great book about this. It was heard over a thousand miles away. Uh, there were tidal surges in London all the way around the world. Uh, and the global temperature actually dropped two degrees for three or four years because of the soot that was in the air. So you can imagine that 180 decibels is a heck of a lot more than twice what a kind of a mild factory sound might be. So as this goes up, this gets much, much, much more powerful. A train horn is about 120 decibels, and actually a gunshot is somewhere in there as well. It's about 117 decibels, depending on the gun, I suppose. So what happens when you have hearing loss? Uh, I'm, I should stop here and say there are a number of other things that can cause hearing loss. Genetic predisposition is a big one of them. Uh, other things like chemotherapy uh, and other kinds of medications can do it. Uh, there are a, a litany of things that can do it, but I, I don't really want to go through all of them because I've covered most of what l would probably show up. Uh, there are certain other circumstances, though. So what, what's the effect of having hearing loss? Well, I would bet some of the people in here know what it's like to have hearing loss. The first thing is that you, get, you have difficulty hearing, and that's not a big surprise. And it's somewhat different, although it doesn't sound it, but it's somewhat different than difficulty understanding, okay? So you might be able to hear someone, but if you can't understand them, that's just irritating. Uh, the, way, the way this works, uh, in, if you listen to someone's voice, the vowel sounds, A, O, A, uh, are all low frequency sounds. And that carries a lot of the volume in our voice. The high frequency sounds are the consonants, all of the things that give speech crispness and clarity. Now, in both of the instances I just told you, the age-related and noise-induced hearing loss, the high-frequency sounds are the first to go. All right? So you start to listen to people, and you've lost all of the high-frequency sounds, and you've lost the clarity. So it sounds like the teacher in the peanuts again. Okay? That's where the difficulty understanding comes from. Now, the next problem is social withdrawal, which is a fancy way of saying you don't do what you want to do. Right? If you don't want to go out for coffee because you can't hear the guy you're talking to, or if you don't make a bid in cards or the punchline in the movie isn't funny, that, that has a significant impact on your life. Okay? This uh, is another recent study that looked at what happens to people who have hearing loss. Now, again, this is mild hearing loss. This is not people who are stone cold deaf and you're shouting into their ears. This is mild hearing loss that you may or may not know you have. If you're looking at this graph, the blue bar is people who don't wear hearing aids, uh, and the green bar is people who do. So people who don't wear hearing aids, about 23, 24% of them uh, report sadness or depression. About 14% uh, of people report sadness or depression after they wear hearing aids. Worry and anxiety, about 10% of people are anxious without hearing aids, and about 7% are anxious with. And this was a particularly surprising one, but if you talk about paranoia, which sounds really bad, 
uh, but paranoia, 24% of people are paranoid if they have mild hearing loss. Now, I don't actually have, I didn't do the study, so I, I can't tell you what the question is, but my suspicion is that means, what's that guy saying about me? You know, is, is he saying something behind my back? Is he whispering and I'm not part of this conversation or what's going on? But paranoia is, is a significant problem. Uh, and then emotional turmoil and security. The, the most important thing to get out of this is that generally, if you don't have hearing loss, you, you don't have as much trouble, okay? Now, if you compare that to people who have moderate to severe hearing loss in the same format, about 30% of people that don't correct their hearing are sad or depressed. About 18% of people who don't are anxious. And 35% of people have paranoia, okay? Um, when, I, when we talk about treatment of this in this context and in most contexts, this means using hearing aids. Uh, if you talk about profound hearing loss, which is the people that really can't hear even with hearing aids, this goes up dramatically, although there are many, many fewer people, so it's harder to come up with a study. Pardon me. Can everybody still hear me? Okay. Oh, the people behind, the people that work with me can't hear me. That's fantastic. <laughs> they can't hear me in the office either. No, I'm just kidding. You're fantastic. Uh, so I'm going to talk about two things that I know I'm going to get asked about because people, people have real problems with these and this really bothers them. Uh, tinnitus is the sound of ringing in your ears. Some people call it tinnitus. I don't, it doesn't really matter, but tinnitus is the ringing in your ears. We don't know what causes it. We've got some theories, but none of them are proven. Uh, and it's probably more than just one thing. Uh, in certain circumstances, although quite rare, but in certain circumstances this can indicate a medical problem, although I gotta tell you, very few of them are terribly, terribly dangerous, so unless the tinnitus is keeping you up, don't lose a lot of sleep over this. Um, the, the theories so far are basically that the ear produces sound, and we actually know it does, we can measure it but it's usually a very quiet sound and you don't usually perceive it. But one of the theories is that you're perceiving this sound. Can't prove it really. And that's not the only part of the story because even if you cut the hearing nerve, you still hear the tinnitus. So another part of the theory is kind of like phantom pain. Guys who get amputations or whatever and they still have pain in their toe even though it's long gone. Your brain is looking for a sensation and then I can't find it. It's had it its whole life and now it's gone. And so it sort of makes up its own. Now, that's not an, a very good description, but then again, there's nobody that can give you much better description anyway. Um, there are a couple of things medications can do it, particularly lots and lots of, uh, lots, and lots of aspirin. For those of you with heart problems, please don't stop taking your aspirin because of this. Uh, and then some particular diseases, medications and, and so forth. But uh, hearing aids can be, although are not always helpful. I want to emphasize that because a lot of people will say, well, that didn't help at all. And we don't, without knowing what's causing this, we can't really tell you if it's going to help or not. The only way to know is to try it out, see if it works. Uh, masking is the most commonly prescribed treatment, which is a fancy way of saying, give yourself something else to hear, okay? You're laying in bed at night, it's quiet, it's bugging you, turn on a clock radio between stations or one of those clock radios that makes wave sounds or birds chirping or something. It provides some of that pitch and some of that sound back to your ear so that it doesn't, you don't hear that ringing as much. The other one that I want to talk about is recruitment. Now this is a little less common, but this is that phenomenon where if, you, if you're if you talking to someone with a lot of hearing loss and you say something not quite loud enough for them to hear and you say it a little louder, then they wince and it hurts them, okay? And it's the difference between when you're just barely able to hear a sound and when a sound becomes painful, okay? Now for me, I don't have hearing loss, and so at 20 decibels, I'm just starting to hear a sound. All of those hair cells and all of the nerves are on high alert. They're trying so hard to hear. And as sounds get a little bit louder and a little bit louder, most of them can stand down, okay? They don't have to be on high alert. And by the time we get to a sound that's loud, your ears can protect themselves. Now someone who's got lots and lots of hearing loss, they can just barely hear the truck driving next to them, right? So the, the level at which all of the hair cells that they've got left are on high alert is quite loud already. 
and it's not a big gap between where they can just barely hear and where a sound is so loud that it hurts. Okay? And that's one of those very irritating things, and it's very difficult to treat that. I will tell you that. So that's how, in general, it's broken. So now I'm going to talk about how do we fix it. Um, there, there are no known medications to fix this. Uh, the, there have been some studies that have looked at things like vitamin E. Initially, that was quite, quite appealing. There were some studies in animals that thought this might help, but the human studies have shown that doesn't really make a difference. There are certain types of hearing loss. A recent study said that uh, zinc could help, but it, this is a very uncommon type of hearing loss, at least in the context of what we're talking about. Uh, and that has shown a very small benefit. A benefit, but don't go out and take zinc because it's not going to make that big a difference. None of these things are shown to bring hearing back. There is no way that I can go in and rewire those switches. Okay? The switches are microscopic and they can't be replaced. Hearing aids is the best way to do this. Okay? And the important thing here is we're making the sounds loud enough to hear in the frequencies that you can't hear. So if you have high frequency hearing loss, part of the point is to try and get that high frequency amplified without amplifying all the other sounds. Because making everything louder is not really going to help. It's just going to make it irritating. So I get a lot of questions about, do I have to have hearing aids? Or do I need hearing aids? Well, no. You know, it's hearing loss. It's not cancer. It's not going to kill you unless you get hit by a bus. Don't, but don't do that. So do you need hearing aids? Well, no. Uh, you need to be able to hear. Yeah, and if you don't have trouble hearing, then you don't really need hearing aids. But a better question is, would I benefit from hearing aids? And this is where we were talking earlier about, this is where you've got to be honest with yourself about, do I really have trouble hearing or not? Okay? And there are no shortages of guys out there who are stubborn and say, I don't have any trouble hearing. I just don't want to listen, and that's fine. But I can't change that. Hearing aids are something that you have to use yourself. Okay? Don't ever let a newspaper ad or something push you into getting a hearing aid because they can't put it in for you and they're not going to change the batteries for you and you've got to do the programming and you've got to do it. Okay? If you think you have a problem hearing, that's something that you should look into. But again, be honest with yourself about whether you have hearing loss or not. So how does a hearing aid work? Well, in the same context, if you've got a hearing aid here, see if I can get over here. The hearing aid can sit behind your ear or somewhere around in your ear, okay? And the sound waves come in and they go in here, but they also hit a microphone on the hearing aid. And the hearing aid is kind of like this thing, okay? It takes that sound and it puts it into a speaker and that speaker sits in your ear canal and the sound goes down to your eardrum. And from there, it's basically the same thing. The ear bones move, the plunger moves in and out, the fluid wave goes down the cochlea and it goes up the nerve to your brain, okay? Now, there are some important I feel like Bob Barker. Uh, there are some important aspects of hearing aids. Uh, one of them is battery life. All right? This thing I can plug in, but a, a hearing aid, you need a battery. Okay? And the smaller the battery, the less juice it's got, and the shorter it's going to last. Batteries need to be changed. It's a nuisance, but that's how it goes. Uh, gain uh, is a concept of how much does this thing amplify the sound. So gain is the change between my voice going into this microphone and my voice coming out of those speakers. It's the change in volume, okay? And the more powerful your speaker system, the more gain you can get, okay? So go back to those rock concerts. They got some serious gain on their speakers, okay? Now feedback, sorry, that's feedback, okay? Feedback, there are some people with recruitment out there that didn't appreciate that too much. <laughs> The feedback is when sound goes into the microphone, comes out the speaker, goes back into the microphone, comes out the speaker, and it does that over and over and over and over again. And that's the sound that you get. And you've probably sat in, in church or something and there's a guy down the pew who's got his hearing aid squealing and he can't hear it. Well, that should tell you about how much hearing loss he's got because he can't hear that squealing sound. Uh, Programming and processing. This is, a, this is a big part of where hearing aids have advanced. Uh, programming and processing is teaching your hearing aids what kind of hearing loss you've got and seeing if we can 
improve upon the kind of hearing loss you've got. And they use a lot of really complex mathematical formulas to try and improve on that hearing. Now, one of the other things, this isn't so much a, a factor of, of distortion, I'm sorry, a factor of hearing aids, but this is a factor of, of just the laws of physics. Uh, if I change the sound coming into your ear, if we amplify certain parts of it or if we keep uh, certain parts of it from getting too loud where it hurts or if we change and manipulate the sound, it's going to come out sounding different. It just is. There's no way to change it and not have it be different. So uh, there's no way to have a hearing aid that doesn't have some distortion. And the, the holy grail of this is to try and figure out how to get these algorithms, these mathematical formulas that minimize the distortion and maximize how much you can hear. And that's part of what's been going on. Now there are lots of different kinds of hearing aids and they all have some benefits and they've all got some drawbacks. In general, going from biggest here to smallest here, you've got a behind the ear aid, which is the kind that you've probably seen in the past, the, the, the great big hearing aids with lots and lots of power for the people with lots and lots of hearing loss. Uh, there are a different, there's a relatively newer kind of behind the ear aid called the mini behind the ear. These are much more common now than they had been in the past just because of our improvements in technology. These are quite small to the point where it's actually very difficult to see if someone's hearing them. They come in all sorts of colors to match your hair color and they have all sorts of different sized tubes that go down into your ear and largely you can't, you can't much see those, especially in people with long hair. The next step down in terms of size, although I would say a step up in terms of visibility, is called this in-the-ear or half-shell hearing aid. This is the one that kind of looks like an earplug. It's what the, the TV announcers wear in their ear. Or there's in the canal or completely in the canal. And these are just varying degrees of smaller and smaller and smaller. Now, in general, the smaller your hearing aid is, the less gain it's going to have. Right? It's just a smaller machine. It's got less power. A great big pickup truck has a lot of power and a little, a little uh, econo box doesn't. Okay? So in general, as you have more and more severe hearing loss, you need to have a bigger hearing aid. The, the main advances on top of the size and the, the various things, the first is digital processing. Okay? Digital processing is turning the sound into a computer signal and then turning that computer signal back into sound. And the reason this is important is because it allows us to make a lot more manipulations of the sound as it goes through this little computer. All right, so think of these hearing aids as just little computers. The other, and this is, this is actually particularly interesting in, in Holland and in Michigan because the T-coil or the loop system is very common in Holland, much more common than you would expect. There's a there's a professor at Hope who has written extensively on this, a guy named David Myers. Uh, and the, the loop system is available in many of the theaters around town, most of the churches around town. Now, sadly, we can't even have the speaker system here to work, much less have a loop system. But if you go to hearingloop.org, you can find lists of all the places in various communities that have these loop systems. Now, the loop system is just a part of the hearing aid that's built in, and it's like a little radio uh, tuner, okay? And so if you're in an auditorium like this or, uh, or a church or something and they broadcast what's coming out of the microphone directly into your ear uh, by, the, by way of this loop system, it reduces what we call the signal to noise ratio, okay? My voice is the signal and there's not a lot of noise in here. But the signal to noise ratio is a big part of how are we able to understand things. And a good example of that is after church, you go out in the back in the narthex or the fellowship area or whatever, and you're listening to everybody talk all at once, and you can't hear the one person you are talking to because the signal to noise ratio has gone way up, and that makes it very, very difficult to hear. Okay? So digital processing. So analog sound versus digital sound. It's kind of the difference between a record, an LP, and a compact disc. Okay? So it takes that sound and instead of putting vibrations of the needle of the record player and directly into a speaker, or this would be an analog system, it changes it into a series of ones and zeros, computer speak, and then it processes that sound and it can put it out. Now, if you're just gonna put an amplifier, it doesn't, doesn't make any difference, but if you're gonna try and change the sound as it comes out of the hearing aid, that's a big step forward in terms of what we can do, how we can manipulate that sound. 
in 2001, 97% of hearing aids sold were analog. And in 2009, 97% of hearing aids sold were digital. So we've largely abandoned the digital uh, for the most part. So when hearing aids don't work, you get a cochlear implant. These are famous cochlear implant recipients. This, you may not know her, actually. This is Miss America from uh, 2001, I think. Uh, and when I was at Hopkins, we put her cochlear implant in. Uh, and she's published this, so that's not a HIPAA violation. Uh, Rush Limbaugh's cochlear implant we did not put in, but he has a cochlear implant. Uh, cochlear implants are what to do when hearing aids don't work, okay? Now this is when hearing aids really don't work, okay? To be qualified, at least as far as Medicaid is concerned, in, or I'm sorry, Medicare is concerned in paying for it, and this is true for most of the insurance companies, you have to be able to understand less than half of the words spoken with the best hearing aids you can get. Okay? So this is the people that wear those great big honking hearing aids and they still can't hear me. Okay? So if you can hear me now, you're not a candidate from a cochlear implant. Uh, but there are lots of people who do this. Okay? Uh, you have to have a fair amount of support to do this. Because this isn't like plugging a, a hearing aid in and out and in and out. This requires a surgical procedure, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But this requires a surgical procedure to put an electrode into the cochlea to stimulate the cochlea directly. Okay? It, takes some, it takes a fair amount of work, in particular for young kids. Uh, it takes a fair amount of work for, to teach the brain how to perceive these electrical signals. It was developed in the 60s and 70s when somebody noticed that if you stimulate a nerve during brain surgery, they started to hear the sound of a drum beating. Okay? And so they took that, and a very famous <coughs> ear surgeon named Bill House developed in the late 70s uh, the first house ear implant. Uh, and it only had one electrode, and it was, it was good for, I can hear sound. I can hear a bus coming at me. Couldn't speech, there was no speech discrimination or anything like that. But as technology got better. By 1984, the FDA approved these. And last year, uh, there had been 188,000 of these implants, uh, and 70,000 of them were in the US. Now, about 30,000 of those were kids, or 35,000 were kids, and about 35,000 were adults. Okay? When we started going through the process of getting ready to do cochlear implants here, the, about the cost of doing this is about $45,000. So this is not cheap. It is, in general, covered by insurance when you meet the criteria for this. Now, that's a lot of money. Uh, so how do we decide if this is worth it or not? Well, this is a big area of medicine. How are we deciding what is worth doing? And so one of the measures that we use is called quality of life years per thousand dollars, which is complicated, but it basically says they, take, they give people validated questionnaires that, that realistically and reproducibly tell how do they feel, are they feeling better. They measure that and then they measure how long did they live with this improvement in their quality of life and then they divide that by the amount of money that they spent. Okay, so if we look at some things that we very routinely do like hemodialysis or knee replacement surgery or blood pressure medications like propranolol, okay, cardiac transplantation, these are all dramatically less in the way of improving quality of life for a certain period of time than cochlear implants. So if you look at the, to the children, it's really the same cost, but if you look at the children, obviously they live longer, so they get more <coughs> quality of life years per thousand dollars. But it's a significant improvement in how people do. And the, the guy who did the study looking at 70-year-olds and older, he's also done a lot of work in measuring how do kids do, his interest in particular is pediatric cochlear implants, but kids who get early implants frequently will be mainstreamed in school and they can hear and they can function really quite normally. They do very, very well. So this is what a cochlear implant looks like. Okay. This is the outside portion of the cochlear implant. This sits on the, on the ear here, and then this magnet uh, and wire is, is clipped to the head. And then inside, underneath the skin, the implant itself uh, is this uh, silicone-looking thing with the electrode coming out of it. Okay? Now this is what it looks like on the back of somebody's ear. They come in a bunch of different colors. The microphone 
for the cochlear implant, much like a microphone for a hearing aid, sits right next to your ear. And then it goes into this computer and it, it turns that, this is a very advanced computer, it turns that into a computer signal. That computer signal puts out an electrical signal here uh, and it goes around kind of like an electromagnet. I don't know if you guys know physics, but an electromagnet generates a signal here and that transmits it into the, uh, the wire in the internal portion of the cochlear implant. Now as that, that signal transfers across the scalp behind your ear right here, that uh, induces a signal in the little computer processor underneath the skin. Okay? And then an electrical signal goes down this electrode and into the cochlea. Now if you focus in on this cochlea, uh, the, the electrode right here, it's this kind of pigtail shaped looking thing here. And this is designed to go down that tunnel in the cochlea. Remember we talked about the conch shell. Now if you look very, very closely at those, uh, at the surface of the cochlear implant, these are basically electrodes. Uh, just like a, a, an electrode uh, that you might plug into a skin to, to measure electrical signals from a nerve. These electrodes <coughs> stimulate the nerve endings. Okay. What happens is you drill a little hole in the cochlea here. This is where that plunger sits. The, the stapes moves in and out here. You drill a little hole to make an, an, another opening into the cochlea. And then you slide this electrode down the uh, cochlea itself. And I'm going to walk over here again. The electrodes are sitting right here, right against the surface where the nerve endings are from the auditory nerves. Okay? That is how the cochlear implant works. It takes a signal, it programs it into sound, it sends electricity down this electrode directly into the nerves, and then it goes up to the ear, or I'm sorry, up to the brain. So in the same scheme, you've got sound that goes to the cochlear implant, it induces a, a signal in the cochlear implant inside the skin, and it sends a signal down to the cochlea. The cochlea is stimulated not by the switches, the hair cells, but rather by the electrodes themselves, and a signal goes up to the brain. Okay? It uses a lot, of the same, uh, a lot of the same systems that normal hearing does, it's just that we have to bypass those switches. Now how does it work? Well, how well does it work, I should say. Uh, if you look at people who, before they have their cochlear implant, they understand about 10% 10, about 10 of the words if you read them a list of words in a quiet room or in a soundproof booth. If you look at people after three months, and these are all adults, I'm not going to talk about kids today, but after three months of practicing with this thing, about 75% of, uh, of words are understood by cochlear implant users. And after about a year, about 85% of words are understood by cochlear implant users. There's pretty good studies that look at uh, improvements in hearing and perception of uh, word recognition is what we call this. Can you understand a, a random word coming at you? Uh, some people show improvement up to two years out. Okay, so continuing to work with this, continuing to train your brain as to how to understand these sounds has a significant impact on how well it works. And the same is true, although a little bit less, again, in a noisy environment, it's harder to hear. And so if you put people in a noisy environment in a 60 decibel room, they understand about 55% of words or about 70% of words after a year. And this is just a matter of experience, of, of getting used to how to do this. What, there, there's a huge array of people, there are 188,000 of them, who have cochlear implants. And some people get some mild benefit, they get a little aid in hearing. There's a guy in Canada who actually plays his guitar and can tune his guitar with his cochlear implant. That's a big, that's a big span. So how do we know who's going to get what? Well, we can't always be sure, but things that we know that make you uh, do better, the duration of deafness. In general, the longer you've been deaf, the worse off you're going to be. Okay. And this is just to do with your brain hasn't been using those cells. It hasn't been using those nerves and the wiring isn't working as well as it used to. And even if I ram a, a, a high power electrode in there, it's still not going to work because the connections just aren't there anymore. Okay. Age at implantation. Now, there, there are two parts to this. In, in little kids who are born deaf, 
the earlier you implant their ear with a cochlear implant, the better they're going to do. If you, and we're actually implanting kids. I, I'm not doing it here in Holland, but uh, kids are implanted under one year old now. Because as you're a child and as you're a toddler, you have an enormous amount of capacity to learn. And you have an enormous amount of capacity to wire your brain to do these things. Okay? As they get older and as that capacity diminishes, they don't, they don't do quite as well. Okay? It's still worth doing, but somebody who is what we call prelingually deaf, they never learned to speak before they lost their hearing, has a much, much harder time than someone who already learned to speak and already learned to hear uh, as a general rule. Now, age at implantation also is important for uh, people as they're older. So for age-related hearing loss, if you're, uh, if you're in your 50s and 60s, studies show you do a lot better than if you're in your 80s or 90s. The difference is not as great, though. Okay, so people who are, who are very young uh, and are implanted kind of too late for all of that learning capacity uh, don't do nearly as well, whereas people who are in their 70s, 80s, and 90s still do relatively well. Uh, there's just, they, they are measurably not as good as people who are a little bit younger. Uh, motivation and practice. This is a huge component. If you don't wear the thing, it's, you're never going to understand it, and it's never going to work, just like a hearing aid. If you go and you routinely use this and stimulate those nerves and try and teach your brain how to do it, you're going to do a lot better. And then expectations. Okay, doctors are a lot of things, but divine is not one of them. And I'm never going to make your hearing as good as it was. Uh, and so, expectations is a big part of it. If you expect that this is going to help you in hearing, although not make you, you know, listen to the opera again in the same way, then you're going to be a lot more satisfied with what you get. Okay. In general, uh, the criteria that allow people to get cochlear implants are designed for people who are going to benefit from them, who are going to get them. So if you qualify for them, for the most part, you are likely to get at least some, if not significant, benefit. So this is, this is how a cochlear implant is put in. Okay? Now, this is, uh, again, this doesn't look like a person, but this is just what I see from a hole in the drapes. Okay? The person's head is up here towards the other end of the room. Okay? That's the top of the head. The feet are down over here. This right here, this hole right here, is the ear canal. That place you're not supposed to put Q-tips is right there. So the place your doctor looks in your, your ear is right here. This is through an incision that goes right behind your ear. So you never really see this incision. The ear is folded forward to the top of the screen, and the nose is up at the top of the screen here, and the back of the head is back down here. Now, this is after some of the drilling has already been done. To get to the, to the cochlea, you have to remove some of the bone of what's called the mastoid. Now, the mastoid is this thing right behind here. If you tap on it, that's the mastoid bone. Okay? Now, the parts of the mastoid bone, there's something called the tegmen or the dura. Uh, above that, right above this spot right here, is where your brain sits. Okay? There's a bony wall between the two of them. There's the, what we call the posterior canal wall. This is the back half of the tube that forms your ear canal, and it's made of bone. And then there's what's called the sigmoid sinus, which is the, the blood vessel that brings blood back from your brain and down into your neck. So those are the boundaries of what we call the mastoid cavity. And then deep down in here, this is the acicular chain. Here is the second and the third of the three ear bones. Look uh, if you were to look from behind the ear, that is what you would see. Okay? Now, the facial nerve is the nerve that operates the muscles on that side of your face. Okay? It runs through your ear, right next to where your, uh, your ear bones are, and then down through a little bony tunnel here and out uh, just under your ear and out into your face, and that's how you move your face. Running along with that, for whatever reason, is the nerve that gives you taste on that side of your tongue. Okay? And it runs out right across your eardrum. I don't know why it's there. It's just, it is. Okay? Between those two little forked nerves is a, is a bunch of bone. And if we drill that bone away, you develop what's called the facial recess. And the facial recess is through which I put the cochlear implant. Okay? So I'm going to start. There's a little soundtrack to this. Uh, this is what I listen to when I'm, when I'm operating. It's 
So I, I made this quite a bit faster because obviously you don't want to sit here for the whole time. I don't actually operate this fast. But what you're seeing here is the same orientation. This is the tegmen. This is the posterior canal wall. Here's the ear canal here with the skin lifted up. And then the sigmoid sinus is right here. Oops. So now, having drilled that out, I'm going to start drilling right over where the facial nerve is, right here. Okay? And I, I can see it uh, if, you, if you're under high magnification. So this drill bit right here is about uh, maybe two or three millimeters across. So this is quite small. And as I drill here, you can see a little hole starts to develop, and I use a smaller and smaller drill bit until a hole opens up there. I know it's there, I promise. And then this is what that hole looks like. Now, if you're looking through that hole, this is where the cochlea is. And just above it, right there, that is the third. That's the stapes, the third of those three ear bones. Okay? Now, just below that, on the, on the bottom half of the cochlea, I'm going to drill a little hole into the cochlea itself. Now, the camera and the microscope always slips a little bit. But I'm trying to drill a little teeny hole into that cochlea. And as you get down to the, the inner lining of that cochlea, where the nerves are, you kind of stop and use a little, it's kind of like a paper clip, a long paper clip. Uh, and you try and open that cochlea so that you can slide the electrode in there. Okay, and I drill a little bit away so that finally there's a hole right here. This is called the cochleostomy. It's the hole that I made into the cochlea. And now I'm ready to put that implant in. So the implant goes in a little pocket of skin right behind your ear. And now this is my thumb and that's my index finger. So you get an idea of, I mean, I have big fat hands, but it's not that big. Uh, so this is the electrode. And again, the camera slipped, but here's the electrode with the cochleostomy right there. And I'm going to use some little instruments to try and push that into the cochleostomy. And then there's a little stiffener called a stylet. And as that style, I'm going to switch out for a little, a little uh, tweezers. I'm going to hold on to that stylet and push the electrode down into the cochlea. And then I take the stylet out. And then the last thing you do is you look at it and this little hub right here is where it's supposed to sit at the cochleostomy. So it's supposed to be fully inserted. So I push it a little bit further in. And at this point, I didn't put it on here, but we hook that magnet up to a computer and we check. We make sure, wow, look at that, I stopped it. Uh, we check to make sure that the electrode is in and we can measure how much electricity is going through this thing. And we check to make sure all systems are go. So anyway, so you, you uh, insert that electrode and then we put a little bit of tissue in there to seal that hole shut and then we close the skin over top of it, all right? Now, for a month, you have to let that thing heal in. And then at a month, you come back and we hook that little computer device up and we start programming it. We start the process of trying to get this thing to work to provide hearing back to you. Okay? So, I don't think you need to watch that whole thing again. Uh, it takes me about two hours and 15 minutes. Uh, it, it, it's a about that long. Sorry, they uh, should have asked, how long does that surgery take? It's about a two hour and 15 minute surgery. Uh, it's performed as an outpatient, so you usually go home that same day, usually an hour or two or three after the surgery. Uh, there is an incision about maybe this long. Uh, I have to clip just a little bit of hair, I promise. Everybody asks about this. You have to clip a little bit of hair to make sure it's clean uh, in that area. And then that incision gets closed with dissolvable sutures and you just have to clean it for a week or so and then it's done. Most people uh, are a bit dizzy after this. Remember I mentioned that part of your inner ear's function is to provide balance uh, sensation or provide, uh, it, it measures how fast you're turning. And when you monkey around with that inner ear, it tends to make it so you have decreased balance sensation, usually for a couple of days, but at, at times it can be a week or more. Uh, and a lot of that depends on how's your balance to start with. Okay. Uh, and then it's not terribly, terribly painful. It's, it's nothing like belly surgery. I mean, take, people usually take pain medications for a day or two and that's about it. So, any other questions?
That's a good question. <laughs> What's the risk of damaging the facial nerve? Uh, well, I've done about, uh, the, the, the surgery you saw, apart from the electrode, is called a mastoidectomy. And I've done about 400 mastoidectomies. And once, it was temporarily damaged. Now, that was for a different reason. He had actually had a, some infection in his ear, and it had eaten away the bone over the nerve. But it, it actually came back after many sleepless nights for me. Uh, but the risk, if you look at the literature, if you look at all the studies that have been done, is pretty well under 1%. And I think during my residency, I myself did about 20 of these. And we would, at Hopkins, we did about 150 a year. I never once saw a, a facial nerve injury. Uh, other complications, the main other complication, it's not so much a complication as it's just, People just don't often feel great right after the surgery because of that disequilibrium. Some people get nauseated. Uh, some people have what we call vertigo, which is that sense that you're spinning around. Uh, so those are other, some, some other risks. The device itself fails less than 1% of the time. It's a very, very reliable device, and it's actually getting better and better. There are three different companies that make cochlear implants. Currently, I'm, I'm only doing one of the companies, although there's really not a lot of difference. There's no, there's no proven difference between the, the efficacy or the, the success of any of them. There's certain differences in you know, where they're made and who their customer service is. And eventually we'll do more, but for the moment we're just trying to keep it simple and do just one. Yes, sir. In terms of prevention, um, I think it's worth noting that the uh, decibel scale is logarithmic. Right. Uh, what? Well, he, he was, yeah, sorry. Right, right. He, he mentioned that we were talking about how Krakatoa exploded and it was 180 decibels. He said that the, the, the decibel scale is logarithmic. And I didn't want to say that word because I can't explain it very easily. But uh, no, you're, you're very right. It's, it, the decibels, every one or every increase in 10 is actually, what is it? Is it a doubling? Three doubles. Three doubles, right. And it tells you I'm not very good at math. Sir. Once you do the surgery, you're 100% deaf in that ear, right? Uh, sort of. Uh, the, there is a, for the most part, when you have profound hearing loss in that ear, uh, you lose most of what's left of your hearing. Now, in the, in the bigger centers that are doing lots of these, they've started experimenting with people who have really bad high frequency loss, but not quite as bad low frequency loss. And as the techniques have evolved, uh, we've been able to show there's something called the hybrid cochlear implant where you put a part of an electrode in just to stimulate the high frequencies and you preserve the hearing in the low frequencies. The studies aren't as good. This is only within the last five years or so that people have been doing this. There certainly is evidence that not by definition all of the hearing is lost. Although, in, in general, in, you know, for, for me, I'm not doing these experimental procedures, so I don't, I don't have a lot of proof that that still happens. But for the most part, yes, that, that ear doesn't work very well anymore. Ma'am? Well, I actually get older to have positional vertigo. Not, even just spinning or everything. Why is that a problem? Why is we... Yeah, why as we get older do we have more vertigo? Well, this is, uh, this is, a, this is a whole different conversation. Uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it as much as I can, uh, but this could be a three or four hour lecture, and in fact I spent about nine years learning about this. But um, it's very important, we have terrible, terrible words for balance problems, okay? Uh, dizziness is very nonspecific. It's kind of like going to your mechanic and saying, there's a rattle back there, can you fix it? When I say vertigo, to me vertigo means the sense of spinning around even though you know you're sitting still. Disequilibrium is the sense that you've lost your balance, like you're kind of weaving or falling to one side or lightheaded like you're going to pass out. Um, I, your balance system is very, very complicated. And if you imagine it kind of like a computer, it has inputs, it has a processor, and it has outputs, okay? The inputs, kind of like a keyboard and a mouse, are your eyes, which show you where the horizon is. 
your ears, which measure how fast your head moves around, and your joints. So your, your joints actually send information up to your brain and tell you where they are. Okay? So those inputs go into the back of your brain called your cerebellum, and that's the computer part. That's the box that sits on the floor. And the computer plugs all that information into a math problem, and it spits out an answer. And the answer is, how do I keep from falling over? All right, and so that signal goes out to the postural muscles, the big muscles that keep your body from falling over. All right, and so when that math problem is working just right, it works very well. However, when your vision isn't as good as it used to be, and when your ear doesn't as work, work as well as it used to, or when your joints don't work as well as they used to, for instance, arthritis, or the nerves that bring signals from your joints to your brains, like in diabetes, that math problem isn't math anymore. Now it's algebra, because it's missing part of that equation. Okay, and it can't, I mean, you know how bad I am at math. <laughs> it's very difficult to do algebra quickly. Okay, so your brain has trouble doing this. And so, for instance, as you do this, it's not that you fall over, it's just that you don't catch yourself as quick as you used to, right? Because your brain is kind of trying to catch up with your balance. Now, there are, there are not that many causes of vertigo related to your ear. Benign paroxysmal positional vertigo is one of them, and that's a very common one. There are a number of others that are, are much different and, and, and feel very different and present very differently. Vertigo, as a general rule, uh, is not life-threatening, so long as you're not driving or at the top of a set of steps. Vertigo is typically something wrong, and, and by this I mean that spinning sensation, is typically something wrong with your ear. There are some exceptions to that. It generally will go away on its own, okay? Uh, MRIs and CT scans generally, and I don't want to mislead anybody, but generally are not necessary for this, but it is something that ought to be looked at by a doctor. Okay, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I would never contradict Dr. Winter. <laughs> <laughs> Ever. Uh, no, it, and he's exactly right. The Epley maneuver. So, let me let me just kind of briefly describe what this positional vertigo is. So, inside that inner ear, as a part of the labyrinth, as a part of the balance system are three hula hoops, okay? And there's an X, a Y, and a Z plane. I'm pretty good at geometry, though. Uh, each of those measures a different movement. So there's one that measures this, and there's one that measures this. Now that ear, that labyrinth, is connected directly to your eyes. And it's what makes it so you can do this and not lose your vision. You can focus on something, okay? If it were connected just through your brain, it would take too long, and you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to focus on something. Now, as part of that balance system, there are little teeny crystals in their inner ear. And sometimes, either because of head trauma or some people have it because of uh, migraines, and some people, and in fact most people, just have it, okay? Those little crystals break free and they tumble around inside usually one of those three ear canals. So as you look down or look up or roll over in bed, you get this spinning sensation. You get about 20 seconds or so, as those things are tumbling around in that canal, you get this sensation that you're spinning around. And the sensation is because that rock, is, that little crystal, is tumbling around in your ear, and it's telling your eyes that you're moving, even though you're not, right? So now your eyes are going like this, right? And it thinks that you're moving, and it's trying to catch up with your head moving, but you're not. Now as that rock comes to settle down, it stops, right? And it goes away. Some people don't feel great for even hours afterwards, but for the most part, the vertigo stops. So vertigo that lasts less than a minute or so is almost invariably not a problem. I mean, it's something that can happen again, but it's something that 80 to 90% of the time, doing that Epley maneuver, where we kind of roll that crystal back to where it's supposed to be, will take care of, at least once or twice. If that doesn't work, there are, there's a physical therapist who works uh, through the vestibular rehab up on the north side who is fantastic with this. He, he is very good, and he can give you exercises to do at home to get rid of some of that stuff.
You did that too, huh? John Cummins? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> any any other questions? Oh, sorry, sorry, back here. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So the, the first question is, what does it sound like? Is it tinny or well, everybody describes it a little bit different, and everybody has a bit of a different perception of it. It's mechanical. I mean, there's there's no doubt about it. It it, it has got a different sound than natural sound. Most people become very accustomed to it and would prefer to have it rather than not. But it it's and of course I don't have cochlear implants, so I can't tell you exactly. But it's, it's probably something akin to uh, the distortions of sound you would get with a hearing aid. Probably a little more, just because there's quite a bit more processing and it's, it's not the same natural uh, mechanism getting it into your ear. Uh, the second question, would, would you ever do both ears? And in, in fact, yes, there, there is a whole, uh, a whole series of literature about bilateral cochlear implants. Uh, Lots of people are getting these, particularly children are getting bilateral cochlear implants. And there's very good evidence that shows that people do better when they have hearing on both sides. And that's true whether you've got you know, no hearing loss or if you've got mild hearing loss. Your brain is very, very attuned to the hearing that you've got in both ears. And your ability to understand that something is over there is because it's a little bit louder in this ear and it hits this ear a little bit before it gets to the other ear. And so when you've got hearing loss in this side, everything sounds like it's coming from over here. And if you close your eyes, you tend to do something like this, right? Whereas if you've got bilateral hearing, you tend to be able to localize sound without even looking at it. Now, um, wow, I just forgot what I was going to say. Uh, I'm sorry, this is, this is true as well of um, hearing aids. So, People oftentimes come and say, boy, you know, those hearing aids are awfully expensive. Can I get, just get one? Yeah, but it'd kind of be like getting a monocle. You know, I mean, it, it's not really a good way to go because you're not going to get stereo sound. You're not going to be able to localize the sound. With one exception, some people just have hearing loss in one ear, and in that case, yeah, it would be great to just get one hearing aid. Mary, Dr. Mary Lustig is, is newly regionally famous after having done a television interview today. And she actually understands a lot more about hearing aids than I do. Uh, and she's actually going to explain that one. But it, the question was basically, does uh, processing allow um, uh, consonants to be amplified? Right. Mm -hmm. And I would say definitely, first and foremost, the programming of the hearing aids will take into account the your specific hearing loss and it will give you amplification at each of the frequencies that you need the most. But it also always gives you a little peak um, where most of the consonant sounds are, which is between 2,000 and 4,000 hertz. It'll always give you a little bit extra there. Um, the programming that's necessary for hearing aids, can, is it feasible or practical or allowed? for the individual to do the programming at home instead of having to go the audio or something? <laughs> um, right now, you do have to come into the audiologist's office to do the programming. Um, the, some of the newer hearing aids are coming out with flex volume, which uh, takes into account um, what situation you're turning the hearing aid up and down in, and it will make small adjustments based on that. But um, fine tuning is Any other? Yep. Um, what if the tinnitus prevent you from hearing the high frequency sound? Not necessarily. And most often what happens is by hearing the external sounds, it helps to cover up the ringing that you're having. So I'm sorry. So her question was about something called otosclerosis. Now otosclerosis is a genetic disorder uh, in which the bone, and I'm going to point to it, the bone right here, right around that plunger, hardens. Okay, so odo means ear and sclerosis means hard. There's your Latin learn. So when sound comes in, it's supposed to move the eardrum, it's supposed to move these ear bones, and that plunger is supposed to go in and out. Okay? Now, 
as that plunger gets frozen, imagine there's a little rubber gasket and that rubber gasket hardens and now the plunger won't move in and out. So now the, the hearing comes in and it hits the eardrum and it moves the, ear, the, the first part of the eardrum but the ear bones don't move. So now the fluid wave isn't generated and the signal doesn't go up to the brain. Now the surgery that we can do to correct that, we go in through the, through the ear canal, okay, lift the eardrum up, remove the outer portion or the, they call it the stirrup is the third bone or the stapes is the Latin name. It looks like the stirrup on a horse. And we remove the, the arched part and the top part of that bone. And then we drill a teeny little hole into the tunnel where that, the same tunnel where the cochlear implant goes. And then put a prosthesis in that, in place of that bone. Okay, so now when the uh, eardrum comes in, the eardrum moves, and the ear bones, the first two of them move, but then the prosthesis has replaced the third and it can move in and out again. Now, sometimes, and in fact in about 80 to 90 percent of people, that closes most of their gap. Okay? The way that they use to do this surgery, the, the kind of prosthesis we use to use, had to be pinched onto the, the second ear bone. Okay? And there was a lot of variability in how could that be pinched. Well, there's a, there's a metal called nitinol, which stands for, stands for Naval or Nickel Titanium Naval Ordnance Laboratory. Uh, the Navy developed this metal, and when you cast it in a certain shape and then bend it into a different shape, if you heat it up, it'll go right back to that shape. It's amazing. So now they make the, the prosthesis out of nitinol, and so you just gently heat that prosthesis up. It crimps over, and it doesn't crimp too hard. The problem with the old prosthesis was that if you crimped it too hard, it would, it would pinch that portion of the bone, and that portion of the bone would eventually kind of die off because it had pinched the blood supply to it off. So oftentimes that thing will come loose. Now, it can be revised, but the success rate for revision surgery is not anywhere near as good. The initial surgery is always the best bet. The first procedure, not revisions, but the first procedure in 80 to 90 percent of people you can close the gap between how well the nerve works, because keep in mind, there's nothing wrong with the nerve here. The only problem is this, this little bone isn't frozen. Uh, the gap between how well the nerve could work and how well it does work closes to within five or 10 decibels, okay? Uh, I have some hearing loss. Is there a way to detect whether it's just a normal or whether yep. it's just another problem? Yep, we can test the nerve independently of the ability to hear sound waves through the air. And it, the otosclerosis has a pretty specific looking pattern. Uh, and so you can usually tell, you know, prior to surgery, you can tell just looking at the hearing test whether that is otosclerosis or not. So, yeah. so the, the idea of a percentage of hearing loss is what she's asking. I've got 80% hearing loss. That's actually, the, the reason we have that number is because of work, workman's comp. And in the legal system wanted a measure. They wanted a percentage. Well, how much hearing loss have you lost, sir? Well, 80 decibels. Well, what does that mean? Well, they wanted a percentage. So the AMA came up with this math problem. And you plug in the good ear and the bad ear and several different frequencies and all this stuff, and it calculates how much it is. That actually is, nobody really does that, because it doesn't really tell us much of anything. Uh, it doesn't tell us which ear is worse. It doesn't tell us which frequencies are worse. It gives us no indication as to how well you're going to do with hearing aids, et cetera, et cetera. So for the most part, what we describe is what we call mild, which is about uh, what is it, 10, uh, 20 decibels to 40 decibels, and mo uh, moderate, severe, and profound hearing loss. And profound is, you know, can't hear a jet plane kind of hearing loss. But those are the, those are the uh, stages that we basically use because that's much more, it's a much better generalization. And then for more descriptive language, we really need to say a lot more than just a percentage. That's not a, that's not a useful number. What I usually tell people is like buying a car, okay? I, I don't want to drive a Bentley. I certainly don't want to pay for a Bentley. But I don't really want to drive a Yugo either, okay? They are expensive. There's just no way, two ways about it, okay? There are degrees. Really, really cheap hearing aids actually are not that cheap. They're still $800,000. They're just not very good, okay? So 
the most important thing is not how much does it cost, but is it something that's going to make your hearing better? Is it something that you're going to use? Is it something you're going to wear? Can you, you know, if you've got trouble with your fingers, can you, can you touch the buttons? Can you change the battery? It's, the most important thing is that. Now, did you ask if there's somewhere you can pay for a hearing test? Sure. Uh, you can pay for a hearing test, but usually I'm pretty sure that Mary isn't going to fudge the results. Um, we, don't, we don't make our money on hearing aid sales. Okay? I, we're, a, we're a doctor's office. If you would like to come in and get a, a hearing test and pay for it, you're more than welcome to come in, uh, and we can do that. And in fact, insurance will typically cover it, so it's, it shouldn't be an issue. If you want to set up an appointment, just give us a call and we'll get it set up and, and we'll give you a hearing test. The, the problem with hearing aids is you pay for what you get. You know? uh, it, the ones that you see on the store in the, in, the, in the hunting section of Walmart, they're basically just this thing. Okay, they're just an amplifier. They just make it louder. And the problem with that is it makes everything louder. It doesn't help you understand anything. Okay? If you want a hearing aid to work well, you've got to get a good hearing aid. Now, again, you don't need to get the very best hearing aid out there. And even with the best hearing aid that fits you the best, it's still not going to be your normal hearing. I wish it would. I really, it would be great if we could do that. But that's just, you know, again, divinity is not one of my problems. So, thank you so much, and thank you, Dr. Vandermeer. What a great presentation. Yes, thank you. Thank you.